Welcome to Why Is This Good, a podcast by the Naples Writers Workshop. I'm Christine and I'm here with John. Hey, John. Hello. Okay, John, it's your story. Tell us about what you picked. I picked a story by Theodore Sturgeon called The Man Who Lost the Sea. All right. And you're going to read from the beginning for us. Say you're a kid and one dark night you're running along the cold sand with his helicopter in your hand saying very fast, witchy, witchy, witchy. You pass the sick man and he wants you to shove off with that thing. Maybe he thinks you're too old to play with toys. So you squat next to him in the sand and tell him it isn't a toy. It's a model. You tell him, look here. Here's something most people don't know about helicopters. You take a blade of the rotor in your fingers and show him it can move in the hub up and down a little, back and forth a little, and twist a little to change pitch. You start to tell him how this flexibility does away with the gyroscopic effect, but he won't listen. He doesn't want to think about flying, about helicopters, or about you, and he most especially does not want explanations about anything by anybody. Not now. Now he wants to think about the sea, so you go away. The sick man is buried in the cold sand with only his head and his left arm showing. He is dressed in a pressure suit and looks like a man from Mars. Built into his left sleeve is a combination timepiece and pressure gauge. The gauge with a luminous blue indicator, which makes no sense. The clock hands luminous red. He can hear the pounding of surf and the soft, swift pulse of his pumps. One time long ago when he was swimming, he went too deep and stayed down too long and came up too fast. And when he came to, it was like this. They said, don't move, boy. You've got the bends. Don't even try to move. He had tried anyway. It hurt. So now, this time, he lies in the sand without moving, without trying. His head isn't working right. But he knows clearly that it isn't working right, which is a strange thing that happens to people in shock sometimes. Say you were that kid, you could say how it was, because once you woke up lying in the gym office in high school and asked what had happened, they explained how you tried something on the parallel bars and fell on your head. You understood exactly that you couldn't remember falling. Then a minute later, you asked again what had happened, and they told you. You understood it. And a minute later, 41 times they told you, and you understood. It was just that no matter how many times they pushed it into your head, it wouldn't stick there. But all the while, you knew that your head would start working again in time, and in time it did. Of course, if you were that kid, always explaining things to people and to yourself, you wouldn't want to bother the sick man with it now. So how did you find the story? Actually, a person I went to school with for my master's degree posted it on their Facebook and said it was like a meaningful story in their lives. And I was like, hey, I want to read that. Maybe I'll bring it to the podcast. (laughs) Wow. An organic story find. I feel like that doesn't happen anymore for us. So, and you hadn't read it. No, had you I read anything read else? I, I, I wasn't familiar with this writer either, but yeah, 1959 is when it was written. Yeah, originally published in 59. I had not read him either, no. Yeah. So what did you like about it? Oh, I liked the, it was like that kind of dreamy quality. It was, uh, it was like um, good old science fiction, but not yeah. in that kind of like mechanical writing style that you, you read sometimes. Right. It was like a good, like poetic version yes. of old science fiction. I like that. Mechanical is a really good way to describe that genre. I almost feel like, and this is maybe a tangent, but I almost feel like the people that were interested in writing sci-fi back then were interested more in the sci I find them the writing in the science, maybe in the yeah. science. You know what yeah. I mean? Like they're they're very much interested in the uh, could this happen, and less so about the prose. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think that's a lot of what science fiction. Yeah, yeah, but the stuff that we, you and I, I think like draw we're drawn to at least in this podcast is the stuff that like really introduces like the well written fiction part of it, right? Yeah. Well, for the purposes of this podcast, I, I usually want to find stuff that's like what can I learn? I, something I can learn from, you know? Yeah, but that's like when I talk about uh, how I didn't used to like sci fi. It's the pieces that tend to be, like you said, in this dreamy, like, like this is a version of sci-fi that I might read and think to myself, okay, this is less about sci-fi than it is about like something that's well-written and like sounds good and feels good. And it's, it's beautiful. And it just happens to fall into that genre. It's like a gateway drug to a genre I didn't think I liked, you know, but this yeah. podcast has introduced me to sci-fi, I think in general is my point. And, and it's <laughs> not, and it's not in that like mechanical stuff and it's not in the, the kind of older school style of things. We did read an HG. Wells story, but it was the Country of the Blind one. It was more like this science fantasy, I think they called it. But I think H.G. Wells has that style that's like kind of turn of the Hemingway kind of like laid the groundwork for a whole prose style that 
kind of dominated the 20th, certain portions of the certain writers for the whole 20th century. I think Kurt Vonnegut would be in that kind of like where you just like, it's very terse, I suppose. Yeah. Still like you can work with that and do beautiful things with language, but it's not this kind of like more poetic, right? Yeah. Kind of way. And then this particular story playing around with point of view with the switches between second person and third person and like how that kind of gets snarled up in the middle right. and then resolved at the end. Not something you're going to do with that kind of, right. um, I guess what we're, we could call mechanical, just presentational prose. Right. To your point, this from the jump, and obviously you read the beginning, has that quality, you know? And I love stories. I mean, I circled it when I was reading it. Like, say you're a kid. I just love that point of view. Yeah. And uh, I was like, oh, oh no. Like, I wonder if John like knew that I was going to like this part of it. But he kind of, <laughs> he he does that throughout. Like, um, I ended up when I like read it the second time, like circling like the beginning of all of these beginnings of these paragraphs, right? Because like, you kind of forget maybe that you're in that point of view. Like one of the paragraphs starts as a child, he had stood and a couple more paragraphs later. It's like, say you were a kid, but if you were that kid, listen, this is how you met the monster. And it's like, it brings you back to this like point of view over and over, you know, yeah. um, but it like kind of drifts in and out of like, wait, who's talking to who? Who are we talking about? Is this a little kid? There's that one point where it switches that we're listening. Yeah. This is how you met. It's like you want to tell him, listen. And then there's a new paragraph. Listen, yeah. this is how you met. Now, all of a sudden, the you character, like you want to tell him, listen. So the you character is now speaking. And the you character is talking to the guy buried in the sand. And the, the you character says, listen, this is how you met the monster and dissected it. He's telling the guy buried in the sand what happened to him and so that it switches to the second person but a different second person right yeah which is, you know, the first time through, I was like, I got a little confused with it, but I was like, this is more like, that's why I think I use the word dreaming or dream, dreamy, kind of like it was like a, uh, you kind of have to let that go a little bit if you just want to yeah. like just float with it, you know, you don't always have to know who's speaking to whom. And it turns out to not matter because it's all the same person by the end. Yeah. So I had to like, the first time I read it, I was like completely confused, you know, but I did what you're saying and I just kind of went with it because it was beautiful enough. You're getting enough. But before I reread it the second time, I was like, okay, I got to cheat, you know? <laughs> because sometimes I feel like I just, I could reread it a million times and not like get the point. And once you do get the point, it, it doesn't take anything away from the story. I don't think the beauty in this story is realizing that it's one and the same. I don't think it's the surprise element that's what's no, exciting. It's the experience of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's the experience. And like, uh, you keep calling it dreamy. And then like, by the end though, we kind of realize like it's, it's less a dream state than it is. Like he's like dying. Right. It's a con <laughs> mental confusion. Right? Yeah. It's, yeah. it's like it's something's actually happening in his brain that has to do with like, he's confused. He's disoriented. He's like awake, but he's like, he's less in and out of sleep than he is like in and out of like consciousness almost. And like, uh, being like awake and alive and like with it. And so, you know, when we talk about like on your deathbed, seeing people, it's not totally that, but it's like, it's like his whole life flashing before his eyes, you know, this little boy yeah. version. Yeah. And he's like getting advice at the same time that he's like trying to make sense of what's currently happening. And uh, I don't know if I totally got this right, but like by the end, it's like, oh, we did it. We landed on Mars. But you know, in the very last paragraph that the mission is maybe a success, but like he's a casualty of it, you know, but I think what was cute about it was cute is maybe a weak term but like he's hearing from like his childhood self who now we know was always like fixated on this type of thing yes so he's got this little helicopter model and it's like this little boy is like explaining to this grown man, like, look at it. Look how good this is. Like, this is a really good model. And he's like a, just like a smart little kid that grew up and did what he wanted to do, it sounds like. And yeah, there is like a beauty in that, even though he's dying. He tracked Sputnik. I mean, this was written in 59. So when Sputnik was flying across, he was, yeah. he was the kid who tracked it and tried to listen to the the bleeps coming yeah, off he was, of it. He's always been enamored by this kind of thing. And then we realize that he got to go and do what he wanted to do. And it's yeah. almost as if like the state of mind that this guy is in is like we said, he's in and out of like, he's he's dying. And so he's not like totally like hinged on reality here. So like hearing from this boy is like, he's not like fondly uh, reminiscing. You know, he's not like, oh, I had a good childhood. Yeah. You can see like the model changes, right? At first yeah. it's helicopter. By the end, it's the actual spacecraft that brought him to Mars. Right. I'm glad that 
that I was the when I read the section I picked just from the beginning had that paragraph where he talks about your head isn't his head isn't working right. Yeah, and it kind of describes this whole because that sets up like what is going to happen, right? Where he's like getting these little pieces but not quite absorbing them. Like he's like glimpsing all these things that, and then it takes until the very end when he finally like realizes, oh, oh, I made it. <laughs> right, I'm here. And there's little breaks, you know, like there's that point where he's like he's just so fixated on the ocean, right? Right, and then all of a sudden the it's like a um like when you're driving in the highway and uh the heat bends the atmosphere so there's an optical illusion where you're seeing part of the sky on the road right, right. but it looks like water and so that illusion starts dissipating he's like why is there this weird brown smear that's like getting in the water here so part of the journey of all this like what you're saying like reliving his life is like putting it all together having the the confusion break apart and starting to realize who he actually is and like the memories are his memories not like this boy and like the footsteps that he assumed were the kid's footsteps were actually his right. footsteps. And right. uh, that's where the point of view play is coming from. And it's also, like you said, the cute thing, the great thing about this story is like how that all kind of braids together to the ending. Yeah, the kid, even as a kid in his memory or however he's being visited by his former self is like has some kind of wisdom to it, right? He's not just like thinking like, oh, I used to be a little boy that played with models. Like the kid seems to have something important to tell him even as a child like no listen you already did it you like you face the monster and you know this model like look at this it was weird it was very weird and then like by the end it was very sad and then rereading it the second time to kind of realize how it all comes together this seems to be written about a very unique type of person who i think doesn't just exist in this field of like being an astronaut but there's like a type of like self-sacrificing person that is willing to to do these kinds of things and it's just like so single-minded about doing something new and unique uh, like i feel like uh athletes are among this group you know where it's like i'm I'm going to go do this. And it's like this thing I got to do by myself. So it's like fitting that a guy like this, who we know now since a kid, since he was a kid, it was just been fixated on it. It seems like to the exclusion of anything else almost, right? We don't hear about his family growing up. We don't hear about like siblings or relationships. It's just like, (laughs) remember when you were little and you like Sputnik and now you're on Mars. It's like, we did it. So there's something like lonely in that pursuit, I guess is my point. Like a lot of times, like people that are like that fixated on something, they do it on their own, which is why. I, like I, I think about like when I think about like athletes, I'm not thinking about uh, like soccer plays. I'm thinking about like Michael Phelps or something, right? Like you swim and it's just you. Oh yeah. Like you train and it's just you. Like nobody gets it because it's just you and like your own body and your own brain. This is what you think about, and it, so it's like fitting that he would be on this like uh, single mission by himself in this craft, and then at the end they even point out that he doesn't say I made it. He says we made it because he feels like he's doing this like on behalf of someone but he's still like somehow the martyr you know like it has to be a solo mission and because it has to be a solo mission like he has to be the one that deals with it all on his own so it's kind of it's kind of like beautiful that his childhood self would visit him in this moment you know because it is only him like he has to deal with it he's not hearing in this moment the voice of a mentor or a loved one it's him yeah I feel like there's a quality to a certain sci-fi maybe it's specifically about Mars where it's like when we talk about like space travel and like a generational ship or something like you know there's like a bunch of people on the ship and they're all on this mission together and it might be like doomed in the sense that they're all going to die on the ship whatever but they're not lonely yeah but when we hear about space travel stuff it's so often a uh, theme that like whoever is on the craft there may be one or two of them and they are lonely and they're doing it like for some greater good sure but there's also something like selfish in the sense that uh only so many people get to leave this planet to go explore other stuff at this point so it's selfish in the sense that like they get to do it he's thrilled to be the one that gets to go to mars you know and it takes a certain type of human to be like yeah i'll do it even though i know it's like really dangerous and scary and it's just me like he's so hell-bent on this the discovery but it is this like lonely pursuit i like that tone i guess yeah i like that too i think you're right space travel and science fiction lends itself to that kind of loneliness but obviously we, we get that in other places too like you think of uh even that we did that one story of um Harmic mccarthy's like his early early story where the kid was he found like the stuff in the woods like the bullet the gravestone oh and he yeah was making up all that story yeah. about that girl but the story itself dealt with like the 
kid that kind of living in his mind, right? Yeah. Anyway, I like that kind of story because that like living in the mind, like how how you portray somebody's like internal kind of experience of things, especially in like exigent circumstances, like dying on another planet, you know? Yeah. It's fascinating. You know, I mentioned the point of view helps with this kind of thing. And obviously reading this, it made me think a lot about second person. Yeah, right. I remember we've read uh, several second person stories in the podcast. I remember a really long time ago, Rob kind of brought up this thing where um, sometimes when you're telling a story, you slip into the second person. I think the example I gave on the podcast was like um, somebody's interviewing somebody about having swum the English Channel. And they say, well, when you get to the middle of it, you start feeling this in telling a story sometimes you switch yeah to that so you're kind of addressing an audience there but you're a narrator you're right. narrating and you're addressing the audience trying to connect with them trying to make this connection between you as a narrator and the audience so you put it in the second person right i don't know if that's like that feels like a psychological reason to do that i don't know if there's a grammatical reason but then there's other kinds of second person that we've also encountered there's obviously the the imperative second person like the how to thing we yeah about with Lori Moore, How to Become a Writer, the Chicken Wing story, which is kind of like, it's kind of like somebody commanding, it's imperative, right? So it's commanding you, the reader, to do something. This is how you live. But like when we read those stories, we kind of see it as a more of a third person because we're not actually, we're just reading. We're not actually going out and eating chicken wings or, you know, right. doing this. <laughs> We're imagining a character who would. But then there's another kind of uh, second person where it says, you mentioned for some story, I can't remember what it was, but I read it in uh, this book, uh, Dorit Cohn wrote a book called Transparent Minds in like the 70s. And uh, she very briefly mentions this idea that second person can be read as a first person story addressing themselves. Yes. We never aired the uh, the first episode we recorded, but Chad Anderson's story Maiden Kane is like that, where it's like nowadays the memory starts like this, yes, and then you are doing this, you are doing that, and that is, I think, specifically a character saying to themselves, "This is what happened. You are doing this, you, you know." And so it just there's so many different ways to use the second person as right. a uh, as a point of view and explore it that way. You know, reading this story, a lot of those involve a narrator, so there'd be like a first person narrator who's addressing themselves. So even if it doesn't say I, it's you. So it's a, there is a character that's addressing and being addressed. They're the same person, like a mirror. And then even in the Lori Moore, the howdy chicken wings story, you think, you know, it's like a a guru or something that's like telling you, this is how to live. You gotta, you gotta eat chicken wings, you know? So when I started reading this, it's like, say you're a kid. That's the kind of thing somebody would say. It feels like a narrator saying that. And they're talking to somebody likely me because it's using you yeah. so it's creating not just the you character but also the i character even without using the i pronoun and then we switch the kid the you character encounters a third person in this trio so we got the narrator the person they're addressing and then the sick man on the beach right, right. And so it's like all three persons are being represented here first yeah. second and third that kind of like trichotomy <laughs> felt like a uh i was like this story and it's like the only story that i can remember like where that felt like the effect that was yeah. being presented which makes it feel like just exemplar of something really interesting right. to do with point of view and the fact that those all get collapsed down at the end and you realize that that character that is a singular character it's almost like you know the trinity or something it's like it's a singular <laughs> character <laughs> this is I, this is our out. holy trinity no i like That's it right. <laughs> <laughs> and he himself calls himself we it's like we did it yes. right so this is like what a uh, i don't know it's like a marvelous technical accomplishment that gets wrapped into this way of understanding a character the character's own confusion and like reliving their life and everything that happens in the story is just fed by that play with point of view it's just marvelously done yeah i misread the we until you just pointed that out you know that that he's collapsing it in the sense that he's referring to his, himself i mean there's a narrative excuse cuz he they specifically say that he's the kind of person who says we when he means I, but there's also like maybe a thematic or like a yeah a technique based or craft based and also a grammatical reason to, to say that. But yeah, it all works together. 
This is like one of those, uh, it's not like a takeaway, but like one of the things we obviously like the most about this story is that point of view that it's written from, but it's not one that we would encourage anyone to attempt. It's, <laughs> it's complicated. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's not like, oh, uh, you should go out and write the Holy Trinity. Uh, best of luck. We know you can do it. <laughs> like, I don't think you probably can do it. These are also the kinds of stories that, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe I, my argument for point of view is always that like when people start writing a story, I feel like they, at least for me, and that's where it comes from. I like, I'm, I'm very rarely thinking to myself, I'm going to write a first person story. I like have some other idea and I can't tell you when or how or why, but when I start writing it, the point of view is just like whatever I come up with in that moment that feels right. That's what we talked about in that. I think it was the last episode, the end of clay are we made? Because yeah. that was a complicated point of view too, and I think it was it presented that particular story in a in a it was right for that particular story, and this point of view is right for this particular story. And so I think that a lot of this is just the intuition. It's like yeah. you feel like you need a particular lens to, on which to look at the story you're trying to tell. So you pick first person, you pick third person, you pick whatever. And I would almost that's argue the appropriate like lens. like pick is like for me, I don't pick it. Is the well, point? Yeah. You know what I mean? I say like, pick, but that's yeah. It's just, it's just like intuitive. You just you start writing it. that way. Yeah. And if somebody were to tell you to change it, you'd be like, "Well, wait, why?" You know. So for something like this, it's like uh, if you wanted to write second person, I wouldn't tell you to go write second person. I'd probably try know? to talk you out of it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, because I, I know a lot of times when we do talk about this point of view, it's it's rare. It's always very well done, and it's usually like pretty short. Yeah. It can only do so much. So I guess instead of like like encouraging someone to read a story like this or like understand the perspective this way to like go and mimic that part of it. You might instead want to like explore whatever kind of theme from this feels right, because then you can maybe you'll inherently choose something, you know, or you'll be in a mindset that like sends you on the right path. And maybe it's not the perspective that you thought you wanted. Maybe you don't end up writing second person, but you end up writing in a vein that like has that similar feeling to it. You know, like second person is not the only point of view that can achieve like the other parts of the story that we really like no yeah absolutely you could probably do something with third person yeah and I wouldn't even want to necessarily see this story written that way. It's just like he was able to capture it with this point of view. It works really well yeah. for what he's doing, but I doubt he picked it. It probably just came to him and he went with it. People that like set out about like picking something like that scare me. <laughs> it's like, how well can you overthink it before you like know whether or not you can even execute it? I have written stories where I switch point of view after realizing it was the wrong one, but it's always a feeling. Like I would start off one story. I remember the novel that I'm about to. To return to I originally wrote in the third person and it just didn't feel right so it was a feeling like and I think I started yeah. in the third person because the previous thing I'd written had been in third person I was just in that mode yeah. and then partway through I was like let me try it in first I just there's a feeling like I think I should try it in first person and that came out so much better right so it wasn't like I analyzed it and said well these are what I want to accomplish with point of view this is the, the mood this is the distance I want to achieve you know it was just like I feel like I want to look through his eyes more so than looking at his eyes. Well, for the record, I've always chosen the correct point of view. I've never had to switch. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> See, like, I don't even think, my point is I don't even think about it that in that much detail. Like, I think it takes like a very special writer too, to in your case, read something that you're writing in the moment and realize that it's the perspective that needs to change. You told me to change one the perspective one time. Well, and you, it probably, you probably picked wrong. Yeah, you probably picked yeah, wrong. I picked I've wrong never picked, you had I've the never, feeling. Oh, yeah, I've never picked wrong. I've never picked wrong. <laughs> I didn't want to either. I was like, no. <laughs> but do you know what I mean? I just like, I, if I'm reading even my own work or someone else's, like, it's not always like apparent to me that that's even an option. It's not what I yeah. normally go for. And some people I've in group settings have recommended, maybe you change your perspective. And I almost always tell that writer not to do it because like, if you wanted to write it from this perspective, if this is like what's comfortable for you, it's going to be so hard for you to do it like the other way. I think in any perspective, you can figure it out. And the same with tense. I would argue when people are like, I want to write this in present tense because I want it to feel immediate. I'm like, well, immediacy is not only achieved in present tense. Believe it or not, everything you read is in past tense and it feels immediate because you're yeah. reading it immediately. Like that's that's what I mean. Like these like sometimes we're paralyzed by the choice or sometimes deciding at the outset that you're going to tell a second person story in this point. You know what I mean? Like in this time period, or this place and setting and immediacy is like that you go about it the wrong way. It's like think about what you want to achieve for the reader and just like 
like, just start writing. Don't think too hard. I don't know. I agree with that for almost all situations. I think that's the appropriate way to go. The only caveat I would put on that is that it's not wrong to try to think through these terms. No, no. Sometimes changing the point of view can solve a problem. Yes. Like if you if you're coming up against a brick wall, then maybe you do need to change the point of view. But you, like you said, most of the time you can write it in one point of view. These stories that we were reading, like this one, and then the um, end of Clay, or we made it made one. Even the um, second person instruction manual ones, like how to eat chicken wings, how to become a writer. They're using the point of view to do very specific thematic things, right? Right. So like this one with uh, the theme of of a confused person dying and he wants the reader to be a little confused reading it. That's why he switches who the third, second person character is halfway through. And who knows what his process was. He might have come to it and realized, oh, I could do this really cool thing with second person. Let me try it. And then he came up with the story or, you know, who knows what the thing, it just works so well with this that most stories aren't going to need that specific, like technical point of view in the story is not going to be part of the theme of the story. It's like that medical clinic story we read where the yeah. choose your own adventure form was part of the theme because it was the theme of the story was the choices don't matter yeah <laughs> so yeah. let's write it in a form where tr- where you're given a lot of choices that wind up not mattering right so most of the time themes are more like i want to explore like what sadness feels like or i want to explore what it's like to swim underwater you know whatever so the point of view isn't such a uh fixture of that theme yeah i mean you're right like that it's worth thinking about it and maybe you need a change. It's just like, for this story, don't go out and... <laughs> if some third-person version of this were submitted to the workshop, there's no way in the world I would say, you should try second person except like do a, a switcheroo in the middle. That's what I mean. Like, this has, who would this... come up with that? <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't want you to try to come up with it yeah. because how would you execute it then? That's what I mean. Like this guy, just this just happened for him. He was just able to do it. He figured it out. That's not to say you didn't have to edit, but like, eh, I'm sure the first draft was very close to this yeah. type of perspective. Yeah. And it worked. So he went with it. Yeah. So I'm struggling personally for like a takeaway for this one, except that I just really like this tone, I guess, that I've noticed in some of these sci-fi things of these solo missions and this type of character that is like compelled by something that I don't personally understand, you know? (laughs) I mean, like there's something in writing too that's a solo mission, you know? I talk about that with like all the writers over the years that have joined our workshops, you know, where it's like, you're likely pursuing this on your own and I can't do it for you, but you can come and be part of a group where other people are also doing it on their own. And there's something nice to be able to relate to people. But by the end, you're still the guy like crash landing on Mars, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so good luck. Uh, but I, I love this type of character too. So if I was going to like do anything with this story, like I'm just realizing that I like this. There's something about this that like finally made me able to articulate it where it's like I said, like maybe these endurance athletes or like runners or swimmers or whatever, or astronauts, like whoever these people are that go and do these like insane things that only a few people in the world are going to be able to do. Like what compels them and how lonely is it? And what goes through their head? You know, they seem like people that are like uh, detached somehow from not reality, but from other people, you know, like they're happy yeah. to just kind of like do it on their own i doubt this guy's married is my point he doesn't have a wife back home like i hope you make it back honey (laughs) and he's not gonna get with someone that's like i don't think you should go to mars because i don't think you'll come back you know what i mean like (laughs) this this guy is just on his own and uh it's an interesting type of character and they don't have to fall into these you know i'm not saying like go you have to go out and write about an endurance athlete but like what an interesting group of people like we recognize them when we see them i like that takeaway because a lot of times you read a story and you're like man i really love this story Story. I wish I could have written it. I wish this hadn't been written so I could have written it. It's like that kind of like it just captures some feeling that you really love. And I think the takeaway is to say, well, what is it that I really like about it? It's yeah. it's a feeling. It's a kind of character. You can put those feelings and characters into your own writing in different ways. They don't have to copy the story to do it. So identifying yeah. what that is, is just a great step along the way. Because then you, you know you're producing something that you really attach to. Yeah, it's along the same vein somehow. 
What's your takeaway, John? My takeaway, I wasn't sure what it was going to be. It was something about point of view. But I think after our conversation, two things. The first is that, like you said, the probably the best thing to do with point of view is just feel your way to it. Like you don't even have to think about it in these terms, but the feeling is going to come from something like, how am I looking at this story? The way you already are looking at the story is probably going to inform the shape of the story, how the story feels, and it's going to inform your natural inclination for the point of view. Right. And so just go with it. Yeah. The other part of that is sometimes it's worth thinking about. Yeah. And if you come up on a brick wall, point of view might be a thing to, to play with to see if you can get past it. Because maybe you're looking at it from the wrong angle and you want to switch the angle and point of view can help. The second thing I think is takeaway is just as a concrete kind of like exercise that we could take from this is to try just not even stories you, you like or want to finish, just like try exercises where you write in second person for a page Tr yeah. and different, like I talked about different kinds of second person there are, the self-reflective one, the um, storytelling kind of like, and even the the imperative one, like we've talked about before with the how-to manuals, try different kinds of points of view, even within second person with first person as a bunch of them, third person, you can do tons of things with. Just do those things so that you're familiar so that when you are thinking about a story, you've you had experience writing from some random point of view that might slot right in there and you just fall into it because you're familiar with it. If you yeah. don't try other points of view, then you won't know. And you might find that you stumble up against these things in stories more often because you don't have that experience. So that would be the concrete kind of takeaway just practice different techniques. I think even reading more, reading like well, stories yeah. like this is going to expose you to more possibilities as well. Yeah, we don't give that advice nearly enough. Read more. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't by writing that I came across second person for the first time. I didn't invent <laughs> it on my own. That's right. But that is good advice that uh, if you want something like this to come naturally to you, there's an argument to be made for just trying it, even if it doesn't end in a full story. Just practice it. And that'll be in your arsenal for later on. Yeah. Very good. All right. Thanks, guys. If you enjoyed this episode, consider joining our Patreon. Your support helps us keep the show running. Find out more at patreon.com slash why is this good podcast. And for industry news, writing tips, and great short fiction, join our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash Naples Writers Workshop. You can also subscribe to our monthly newsletter at napleswritersworkshop.com.